Good afternoon and um, welcome to, um, to this session um, here at Science Agora 2020. Um, I would like to, before I start, I'd like to thank all the um, organizers of Science Agora 2020, in particular the um, JST for, for organizing um, this event Good and for having afternoon and for having us. And um, welcome to, um, to this session um, here at Science Agora 2020. Um, I would like to, Sorry, before I, I start, I'd like to thank all the um, organizers of. I could hear myself. Apologize for this. Um, so yeah, I'd like to to um, to thank all the organizers of um, of Science Agora 2020, um, in particular JST, um, for having us today. And um, I will um, quickly outline what we um, have in mind um, this afternoon. So I will give a brief introduction into the work of the National Geographic Society, what we're trying to achieve, and, and where we're trying to go. And then you have the opportunity to hear from three fantastic and very exciting explorers from this part of the world um, about what they're doing, the type of work that they're doing and how they're trying to make um, a difference in this world. So, um, and you all have the opportunity to participate in this session. So please do make use of the Slido link, which has been shared um, with you, which is a perfect opportunity for you to ask any questions, to share comments with us because, um, this is um, going to be a, a lot more fun and a lot more um, engaging if, if all of you um, participate. But um, let me um, get right, um, right into this. So I will um, talk a little bit about um, the work of the National Geographic um, Society. So um, we are um, an organization that has been um, around for um, for, for a very long time. We were funded um, in 1888 in Washington, DC. And um, we are um, having the goal since then really that we want to combine science exploration um, and storytelling. So obviously around this time, um, we have adjusted our, our um, strategic direction and we have um, had slightly different um, objectives, but I would say that um, really, since day one, we have um, combined the um, understanding of the planet to explore more of this world and telling the stories and sharing the knowledge um, about this. So um, currently, we describe ourselves um, as an organization that uses the power of science, um, education, um, storytelling um, to illuminate and protect the wonders of the world. So, um, you know, we were funded in 1888 by um, a group of bearded men. And I think this fashion is, is now in 2020 becoming um, popular again. But as I said, we had always in mind the idea to combine um, science, storytelling, and, 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 and um, even our first grantees, when they, um, when they had new discoveries, when they completed the exploration, they were asked to come back to our headquarters um, in Washington, D.C. to tell their story to a general audience um, so that they can share their knowledge and understand um, what they're doing. So, um, you know, we have had many um, things or projects and, and partners that we've worked with in our long history, but let me just um, talk about um, some of them. So, um, I think a lot of people here know um, Jane Goodall, so she was um, you know, a grantee that, that, um, that has had, um, her, her work has gotten a lot of attention. But the reason I bring this up is that actually in 1965, um, we had a documentary team um, or documentary filmmaking team accompany Jane um, in, in her, with her work. And um, essentially the, the documentary that came out of it was such a success, was, um, was, was interesting um, for, for, for so many, people that um, there was so much demand for it that we started doing more of these documentaries. It's, it's um, nowadays a lot of people actually primarily know Nat Geo for the television, primarily know Nat Geo for, um, for, for, for our um, documentaries that we're doing, but it's, it, it was really only 1965 that we've done um, the first 
um, documentary. And I think another example of the work that we're doing that illustrates quite nicely um, how we work is the work that Robert Ballard and his team did um, in the middle, middle of the 80s to discover the Titanic. So, um, you know, it was not only the money that um, National Geographic gave to the team to, to make this work possible, but in effect, it was actually a lot of the National Geographic engineers that are sitting in our basement um, that were working with Rob and his team to, to um, drive innovation to make this technology possible. So um, in these days, underwater photography in these depth and videography was, was not possible. So there was a lot of inventions and patents were needed um, to make all of this happening. So, um, you know, and, and, and the, the guys that are sitting in our basement, they're still advancing a lot of thoughts and, and, and a lot of the technology around camera traps, around, um, you know, photography, videography and, 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 and other um, technology in, in, in harsh environments. And, and we continue to do so um, to date. Um, but, but let me just also emphasize that besides the science part and besides the exploration part that, that we will talk about um, this afternoon, um, that we obviously also have a very strong and powerful global voice. So through social media, through the films and through um, television, but of course also through our magazines, um, we have the power um, to reach around 800 million people around the globe every single month. And obviously we can reach them with stories that matter. We can talk to them about climate change. We can talk to them about biodiversity loss. We can talk about, um, about how we migrated this, this planet and how future societies lived on this planet. And we are a voice that people trust. So, so obviously this is a huge opportunity for us, but it's also a very big responsibility to use the power of this brand in, in a meaningful way and to live up to the trust um, that people have given us today. So um, you all know that you will hear this afternoon from, from three explorers from, from, from Asia, but I think it's important to note that um, we have been giving grants for a very long time. So we've given our first grant um, soon after we were founded in, in 1888. And um, just last year, we've actually passed um, 14,000 grants. So we've given out um, a lot of grants through our history. So our explorers, as you can see here on the map, um, work all around the world and our explorers are typically scientists, educators, conservationists, technologists, or storytellers. And actually today, this afternoon, we have a nice mix um, of that, um, of these kind of um, professions ready for you. Um, our explorers typically work in these four fields. So they work in, in um, what we call human story. That's a lot of um, understanding where we come from, how we settled the planet and how past societies lived. Critical species, obviously a lot of questions related to biodiversity um, and endangered species. And then also um, the natural world, how the larger scale ecosystems work and um, sustainable future. So just to give you um, a quick overview of the type of work that we fund, it's typically conservation work, both um, in the natural world but also obviously um, in terms of cultural heritage and conserving um, some of these sites. It's education work, it's research work, it's storytelling and it's technology, as I've mentioned with the example of the discovery of the Titanic. So overall, it's, it's, it's a pretty big scope that, that we have as an organization that we're trying to, to work for. So let me break it down a little bit just with some kind of um, projects that, um, that we're working on. So, um, you know, we, we're looking at planetary health. So we're really looking at understanding large scale ecosystems, how they're changing and what their implications and relevance for, for, for the wider natural world are. We're looking at e emerging system level threats that are um, threatening these, um, these ecosystems and how, and how they're impacting them. We're also looking at uh, the last world places. So we're trying to understand where these places are, how they function, how, how they work and map them in order to promote them and to ultimately um, protect them. We, um, we do, you know, I've mentioned species, so, so a lot of the work is in the species field. So we, we still fund a lot of basic research that relates to understanding um, the status of the world species and to understand um, the trends in population, how they're doing. We have a lot of projects that address the threats to the diversity of life and um, really working on bringing these species back from the brink of extinction to ensure that they can um, survive 
um, with us and, and on this planet in the future. And then um, we look at what we call being human. So we're trying to define the human this, you know, condition and look at how did we evolve as a species? How did past societies live? How did we settle the planet? But we're also looking ahead. How are we going to live um, in a, on a planet with 10 billion people, um, which is pro projected? How do we um, survive with 10 billion people when, when we have scarce resources um, and, and increased comp competition? And, and what are the, the, the kind of thinking um, and, and, and things that we can learn to, to increase human resilience um, so that we can survive and, and drive innovation in a rapidly changing environment? So. Um, just some some more examples of, of the work that we do. I mean, I've mentioned um, technology quite a lot. So what you see here is um, a 3D rendered national park in Africa. And um, you can actually see a simulation of animals which are, um, th you know, which are um, geotracked um, as they're moving live um, through their natural habitat. So, so those are the kind of projects that that we're working on and imagine the, the, the kind of understanding, the kind of knowledge that we can build through this kind of technology by observing these animals 365 days a year, 24 seven in their natural habitat. Um, and, and just as a disclaimer, um, this information is not widely available. So, so poachers and others that are looking for rhino or ivory um, are obviously not able to access that, that real time information, but for science and in the right hands, this, this information obviously is very, very useful. Um, sort of other projects that illustrate how we work and how we function is the, um, the photo arc project by Joel Satori. So he set out to um, create a photographic memory of every single species that's in captivity. And um, basically we see a lot of value in this for two reasons. So one is that we think that Joel, um, by creating this gigantic, enormous um, collection of, of, of really impressive photography of, of these species, it's, it's a perfect illustration of the beauty and the diversity of life. So, you know, exhibitions for kids and, and, and TV shows and, and many other ways that, that allow people that are normally not engaging with nature um, can through the photo arc re regain or rekindle their love with nature and just really marvel at the beauty of life. But there's also the fact that we're losing species. So Joel also wants to make sure that we're having at least a photographic memory of these species before we use them. So, um, you know, again, it, it, it's a great combination of science and, and, and direct storytelling and, and reaching audiences. Um, Obviously, we're, we're looking as, as one of the topics at, at wildlife trade. And for example, here, um, there was some work that looked at the impact of, of wildlife tourism. Um, we're working with a large number of organizations and governments um, around the world to get more um, ambitious agreements towards protecting the planet and protecting land. So we're part of a coalition that aims to have 30% of the planet um, protected by um, by 2030, because we believe that um, by doing so is really the, the only chance to give us an opportunity um, to meet our climate change goal and also more importantly to, to protect enough species and, and resources um, that we can continue to live sustainably um, on this planet. And then we're having um, larger projects which we call sort of the earth engines, um, which is really looking at the larger scale ecosystems um, such as mountains, oceans, and rainforests, and, and still trying to um, understand even better how important these big um, ecosystems are for, for other systems. So, um, you know, really how, how much and what glaciers and the relationships to glaciers and waterfall, rainforests, and so on. So, so there's a lot of things that are still um, not understood where we want to, um, to, to, to help through exploration and science to understand their functionality um, even better. So um, this is this was sort of the, the brief overview of, um, of what we're um, trying to um, to achieve as at the National Geographic um, Society. So um, I would like to to sort of end by emphasizing that obviously as a grant giving organization funding is very important, but we believe that um, there's actually 
a lot more to, to being a National Geographic Explorer than the funding for the projects that we're funding. We really hope that we can um, promote and, um, and elevate our explorers and that um, by, um, by doing so, that um, we can um, really enable them to be the, the best possible um, version of themselves to, um, to be the most um, impactful and to achieve more impact um, by um, through training, through elevation, through networking, and um, really also through open doors um, with our well-known brands. So um, let me end um, by really talking a little bit about what does it mean to be an explorer from, from our end? So, um, you know, from, from since 1888, as I said, um, we've brought together extraordinary individuals from around the world that have very diverse backgrounds that have that are pursuing very different types of work, but I actually think um, that they share some things in common, which we sort of sometimes refer to as the um, explorer's mindset. So everyone that's gonna talk today relates to all or some of these aspects. So for us, National Geographic explorers are leaders or problem solvers. They're generally informed, curious, and often capable individuals who are committed to making the world a better place in their specific um, field of work. They usually have a sense of responsibility and respect for other people, cultures, and the national world. They are often empowered to make a difference, pursue bold ideas, and persist in the face of challenges. Um, part of their, their work is to observe, document, and engage um, with the world around them. Um, and often they do tell stories that inspire others. Um, together, they create and foster a global community that's committed um, for a sustainable future. And um, lastly, they're all committed to supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion in their respective fields. So um, I think this gives you sort of a, a broad idea of, of what um, connects these explorers and, and how they're um, how, how they're um, how they're working together, and um, I want to um, just finish really by 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 saying that we also um, recognize that um, it's not only important um, what they do, but also how explorers are are doing their work, and um, you know our explorers are usually treating their peers and others in the community with respect, they present and share their work in an open, truthful and accurate manner. Um, they often, you know, willingly collaborating with others and support other members um, of the, of, in the communities. And finally, they set an example um, and mentor other people um, around them because we believe that um, this is so, so um, important. So um, with that, I'd like to um, end my, my, my quick introduction of, of, uh, of an organization. I, I understand that this is on the one hand quite a lot to take in. On the other hand, um, this was really just a very brief overview of, um, of an organization that has 132 years old, uh, two years of history. But um, let's get into what you've all been waiting for. Let's uh, have the opportunity to hear um, from three of our Asian explorers. And just before um, I, I, um, I hand over to, um, to the first one, just again, a reminder to please um, make use of, um, of the, um, the, the, um, the Slido notes. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, if you have any questions to me or any of the other speech speakers, um, please feel free to use um, to use Slido. So um, now I'd like to um, introduce our first explorer for, for this afternoon, which is um, Yukinori Kawe. Um, and he saw the Giza pyramids in 1992 as a 19-year-old um, recent high school graduate for the for the first time when he had moved to Cairo from um, from Japan. And I don't know if if um, if this was a plan, but he ultimately ended up spending 16 years in Egypt. Um, during which he also graduated from the American University in Cairo um, with a BA in Egyptology um, in 2003. And um, Yuki has, um, after the 3D technology in the field of Egyptian archaeology, 
um, was introduced really quickly, took on this, this technology, and he began conducting um, 3D surveys of, um, of these ancient structures. Um, and he's built a career and name around that, and he will talk more about that, that work um, later. In 2016, Yuki received um, a National Geographic Emerging Explorer grant from us. Um, in 2017, his team used the drone to obtain the world's first detail, de detailed image of the street pyramids at Giza. And um, currently, Yuki is conducting several interdisciplinary researches um, as an associate professor at the Institute for Advanced Research at Nagoya University. So, this was um, a very brief in introduction to, to Yuki, but he will talk, uh, I think, more about the exciting stuff um, that he's doing at the moment. So Yuki, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for very detailed you know, introduction. <laughs> so I'm very appreciated. So I'm very pleased to, be, uh, to give a presentation uh, here as a National Geographic Explorer. So I'm going to share my slide and then uh, we can actually uh, enjoy together uh, to see uh, what I'm doing now at Giza Pyramid. Uh, here we are. So uh, as Yannick uh, told, uh, told you guys, so I became National Geographic Explorer uh, in 2016, Emerging Explorer. Although I have already, uh, you know, the carried out uh, several archaeological projects in Egypt for more than 15 years, but being a National Geo Explorer, I promote my archaeological uh, project in a number of the way. So today I'm going to talk about my uh, 3D survey project of e uh, pyramid in Egypt, uh, supported by our academic colleagues, uh, TBS, Sekai Fushigahakken, it's a very famous uh, program in Japan and also National Geographic Society. Um, so this uh, video footage uh, you are seeing uh, is a top of uh, the second pyramid, the Kafre pyramid at Giza. So even though, uh, you know, uh, it is a pyramid, everyone knows. So no one uh, was uh, able to see uh, the detail of this place. Um, unlike what is commonly thought, so archaeology is not only to find ruins and artifacts, but more importantly, uh, to keep a record of everything we do. So then future generation uh, can virtually reconstruct the result of our work. So a drone is now so one of the powerful tools for archaeological survey to obtain 2D information uh, of the place like, like here we couldn't uh, access. But uh, moreover, we can produce 3D data uh, from uh, 2D image data sets. So there are, as you know, uh, numerous hypotheses on the construction of the Great Pyramid, but only few uh, actual survey has been conducted, uh, such as uh, that of Flinders Petrie is the first of uh, Egyptian archaeology in the 1880s. So these archaeological survey uh, have only uh, focus on the external part of the pyramid, the monument, and uh, in uh, space such as the chamber and the corridor. And uh, no observation of the core of the pyramid has been made. So the masonry of the pyramids of this period, now we call it in the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom, has not yet been fully uh, studied, excavated, uh, investigated because uh, most of the pyramids uh, in this period, even it is like, you know, 4,500 years ago, uh, were preserved. So you cannot uh, see the, you know, the section of the pyramid, but uh, the general opinion, or the, you know, the first, the core may consist of a horizontal arranged block. And the second pyramid may have core steps and third, so the core may be built with what we call uh, acceleration layers. So the importance of the study of the inside structure of the pyramid is that you know, the core masonry is closely uh, related to the uh, construction methods, uh, the, namely the type of ramp 
uh, ancient Egyptian would have been employed. So for example, the straight ramp, it's a famous ramp, uh, is probably uh, suitable for setting a uh, horizontal arranged block. And uh, reversing ramps, a uh, zigzag ramp, uh, can be easy to rest on the core step, uh, while acceleration layer core would be appropriate uh, for an envelope or a spiral ramp. So each theory has advantages and disadvantages, but the theory without you know, the study of the core masonry remains only theories on paper. So this is a great pyramid of King Khufu. There is, however, uh, you know, the place where we can actually observe uh, the core masonry of the Great Pyramid. But uh, if you want to observe this, you have to, you know, the climb up to the pyramid. Yeah, because you know it is located at the northeast corner of the pyramid and about 80 meters from the ground. So in 2013 and 2015, so Japanese TV production company, uh, TV Man Union had the opportunity to climb the pyramid. So I was with them and then climb up the pyramid to obtain the data of the masonry structure of the pyramid. So uh, this is a small half open space called the notch. The notch is located in the 104th course of the northeast corner of the pyramid. Yeah, it is often said that you know the stone of the pyramids uh, were perfectly set, but as you can see here, uh, the stone inside the pyramid are not perfectly set. And interestingly, so notch has a crevice uh, in the west that led to another open space called the cave. So we are now in the cave inside the pyramid. So this place can show core masonry structure. So this is now you are seeing is our 3D data uh, image produced from uh, image data, which analyzed by structure from motion technique. So as I mentioned before, so general opinion, uh, so uh, regarding core masonry, uh, like you know the core may consist of a horizontally arranged block, or a pyramid may have core steps, or like you know acceleration layer. However, uh, also photographic section we produce from 3D data shows actually different structure from pre uh, previous salt. And besides the notch at, and the cape, there are other what we call the region of interest, uh, such as uh, you know, the upper part of the Kafra's pyramids, uh, where we can observe the relationship among casing stone and uh, backing stone, uh, and also quamationally. And then top of the Great Pyramid is also the important, you know, where we can observe the inner structure at the top cross uh, sectional view. So this is the top. Uh, so the Great Pyramid was presumably uh, constructed from 210 limestone courses. However, uh, due to the loss of outer casing stone, uh, so uh, we can actually, you know, the top of the pyramid is currently, you know, exposed and then, you know, approximately 12 meter exposure of the 201st uh, uh, course. So again, I you know uh, stood at the top and uh, took many photos, uh, then tried to use the structure from motion to produce 3D data, but uh, this didn't work well. Uh, for the production of perfect 3D data uh, of the top, it is necessary to you know the photograph uh, using a drone uh, from more you know the distance uh, places and then more you know the angles. So initially, uh, we are thinking about to uh, about you know, bringing a drone uh, into Egypt, but uh, it was actually difficult because uh, in Arabic, uh, a drone is called a spy plane. So <laughs> the Egyptian authority are concerned, very concerned about you know, the risk of drone being used for military purpose. So it, it was impossible to bring it into Egypt from you know foreign country at that time. 
But uh, you know, the by series of happy accidents, uh, we could finally carry out you know the drone survey. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned, so I was elected an uh, emerging uh, explorer of the National Geographic Society. So uh, this is not, of course, my personal achievement, but uh, my achievement of my all team members. So the next uh, on the 30th, you know, the anniversary of the TV, I mean, very famous Japanese TV program called World Mysterious Discovery, Sekai Fushiga Hakken, produced by TBS and uh, TV Man Union. So uh, they decided to collaborate with National Geographic Society and to support National Geographic Explorer. So TV Man Union found a local drone company who obtained a special permission from the military to use a drone in Egypt. So uh, we used it. So for each pyramid at Giza, we took in the pictures in detail of the, you know, the each face. So this small, you know, the square marks in this slide, uh, which is the east side of the Kafra's pyramid, uh, a position where we photographed with drone uh, for Giza pyramid. So total number of the photographs taken by drone is around, you know, 30,000 actually. So this is uh, uh, one of the, our final product. The, this is a 3D image created by our team member, uh, Mr. Ichikawa, a CG artist. So this is, yeah, it's again, uh, not imaginary CG computer graphic, but uh, this is a based on 3D model integrated with GNSS, I mean, survey uh, data. So each stone uh, represents original shape uh, and the sides and the orientation. So this is a remarkable result. And then this 3D data also allowed for archaeological, you know, uh, comparison uh, of the forms uh, of the pyramid. Uh, like in a comparison of the, this is, uh, you know, the pyramid of the third pyramid of the main kaule. So uh, comparison of the main kaule pyramid with uh, what we call in a collapsed pyramid built by King Sneffer at Meidum, uh, yellow pyramid of the collapsed pyramids uh, built by Meidum. So where the inner core structure is, you know, the facing out, uh, which revealed that main Kaula's pyramid has a similar core, you know, structure to that of the Meidum pyramid. So even our 3D data uh, is not only beneficial for you know, the academics, but also for educational entertainment. Uh, we produced in the pyramid of VR, so which 8K and the 360 degree image uh, published in YouTube. So everyone can enjoy and our data set with uh, uh, VR like you know, the Google. So you can just you know, use the VR Google. This is like you know, $20 and uh, $30, just put your uh, you know, the iPhone or you know, the smartphone and then you can enjoy 368K, uh, you know, the Giza uh, image. So uh, I will uh, later send a uh, link uh, to the chat so everybody can enjoy it. So especially now, so, you know, that we are difficult to visit in Egypt in this circumstance, but we can actually enjoy VR, so please visit our site. So thank you very much for uh, paying attention and uh, this is the end of our presentation, so. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Yuki. I think this is a very, um, very, very fascinating work, work that you're doing and I think, um, for, for, for the audience, um, you know, we, we've now seen um, Egyptology and, 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 and work about understanding um, the past. And we're now moving to conservation efforts um, that are um, more looking at, at, at species um, that, that need protection. So um, we'll, we'll go back to, to all the speakers after everyone had the chance to, to present. So if you have, I've already seen that there are some questions to Yuki. So if there are any more in Slido, um, do please share. Um, but yeah, we, we'll have the question, the Q and A after um, each, each presentation. So um, next up is um, Rahayu Octaviani. Um, she's a primate conservationist who is extensively studying the behavior of her 
um, beloved Silvery Gibbons. Um, she received a bachelor's degree in forest conservation and a master's in ecology. And she worked with the Eva University in, um, in, in Korea on a long-term project on the Gibbons um, in her home country, Indonesia. Um, in addition to continuing or conducting regular monitoring of three groups of silver gibbons at the park where she's working, um, she also initiated a conservation education program for the local children in the area so that they can develop a sense of connection to the biodiversity um, in their area. And as she, as Ayu will mention, she leads a team um, in this sustainable conservation effort and hopes that local engagement in these efforts will encourage and empower them to become conservational agents um, in their own communities in the future. IU is also part of the 2020 cohort of National Geographic Early Career Leaders. And um, with that, I'd like to hand over to you, IU. Thank you, Yannick, for the introduction. And thank you as well for the organizer of the Science Agora. I'm so happy to be here and I hope today I can share a bit about our works, okay. Okay, okay can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay, okay, good to hear. Uh, so as Yannick has introduced, my name is Rahayo Octaviani and today I would like to share about our works in Java to have better understanding about one of the last non-primate species and how to spread the conservation message to public in general. So this is Java Island, my hometown, and one of the most populated island on earth and home for almost about 60% of the Indonesian population. But unfortunately, as you can see in the screen, less than 10% of the original forest left and the remaining forest patches, particularly in the Western to the central part in Java are the only remaining habitat for this small ip in here that living in this island and it's called silvery or the Javan gibbon. So this is silvery or the Javan gibbon and just like the other species, Javan gibbons also impact heavily by the anthropogenic disturbance, fragmentation, devastation, along with illegal threat to keep them as pets. And usually the hunters will targeting the baby because the baby is still cute. And sadly, Japan Gibbon is one of the most traded uh, primate species in the social media. So because of that reason, through our organization, we are taking part to protect and try to raise awareness about this swinging ape in one of the largest remaining rainforests in West Java. So this is our site in Chetalahap Forest, part of the Gunung Halimun Solak Nasya Park, a stunning sub mountain forest that always be in my heart and known as the one of the last harbor for the Japan Gibbon. And also home for many endangered species like the Japan leopard, hawk eagles, lowrys, and many more. And this area has a direct boundary with the um, enclave, one small village over here. And our camp is located in the middle of the village. And it also has a boundary with the agricultural land and also the tea plantation that actually can become a potential threat for the habitat as well. So it is very necessary to working closely with the community who are living alongside with the endangered species. And of course, with the rainforest itself because it is very important to make them more aware about the ecosystem service provided by the, by the rainforest and gain the support and make the people uh, feeling pride to the treasure in the backyard. So here, this is our team and we are working on the ground together with the local community members involved them in the conservation effort by conduct a long-term uh, scientific behavior about behavior scientific uh, research on the behavior and ecology of Japan Gibbon since 2007. We, we are doing the regular monitoring, conservation education program, and also community engagement in the ecotourism sector. So this is our field team who are working in the front line to regularly monitor the Japan Gibbons in Chital Forest. And we are also working closely with the National Park Authority to schedule the forest patrol. This is kind of like the typical day in the field where our team usually will go to the forest, try to find the gibbons. And if we are lucky, we can follow and observe the groups until they're sleeping trees. 
and on the next day we rise earlier and waiting uh, waiting for them in the sleeping tree and they will start the activity again but however not all of the observation can be success sometimes in the middle of, of observation we can lose them because they are often traveling in the upper forest canopy while we have to struggle walking with two feet go up and down the valley cross the river and so on and well that's a challenge that we are working in the in the middle of the rainforest but another thing is the Japan gibbon is also a talented singer and sometimes it can help us to detect the location based on their songs and today i would like you to hear this beautiful song that um, song of the female of the Japan gibbon so you can imagine yourself standing in the middle of the rainforest and suddenly this song is roaming across the canopy. I hope this song will work too. Okay, so this song still makes me grin happily whenever I hear it. And this song also has paving my way to work as a primate conservationist. And actually each gibbon species has a very distinct call between the species. And Japan gibbon is very unique because unlike the other species, Japan gibbon don't do duet between female and male. And the female is the dominant singer for this species. Oops, sorry. Okay. So please meet the whole groups. These are the three groups of Japan Gibbon that we are monitoring regularly by following them from dawn to dusk. And we are documented their behavior, ecology, their demography, what do they eat, where do they sleep, how's the interaction between each, um, each individuals and so on. We call them as the group A, group B, and the group S. And it is very rewarding and a privilege when you can see the birth of an infant in the wild and see them growing up becoming a young adult and find their own faith by leave the natal group and disperse just like this one. This is Kim Kim. He was born in 2011 and in March this year at about nine years old, he just dispersed. So one of the important event that we witnessed from a wild population and the long-term research effort. So now our team are keeping our eyes to monitor other groups, whether the young adult with similar age with Kim Kim are getting to disperse soon, or even the adult pairs produce a new baby. As one of the result of our long-term research by tracking the gibbon, we got information about the home range area of these three groups across the years. So we compare this home range with the, uh, with the gibbon in the other area, such as in the lowland area. And we found out that the gibbon in our area has larger home range. It's about like 32 hectare in average. And we also found the stability in the home range of each group, um, like we show uh, throughout the year from 2015 to 2019. So this is the home range of the group A, B and S in 2015. And then in 2016, 2017, 2019 to 2019, yeah. And the majority of the typical primate activity budget is spent feeding and moving between the feeding locations. And Japan gibbon are rely heavily on fruits in their diet. So we call them as the frugivore species. And so far we have identified about 104 food species consumed by them. And National Geographic Society has support us to um, identify the one of the most important foods for the Japan gibbon, which is the fig species or indigenous ficus. And then we overlay the data and we found out the higher density of fix in the core area and it gives information that core area filled with the critical resources for the Japan gibbon and actually important foods affecting the ranging pattern. So all of those findings are very valuable for the scientific community and also the development of the population and habitat management for the Japan Gibbon. And we try to keep supporting the National Park Authority by providing this kind of information. But one thing that we should not be forgotten is the education effort for public is also a critical part of the conservation. And personally, for me, Gibbons have been a source of inspiration. And I want to share these wonders to all. So this, uh, this small ape, this gibbon will not be forgotten anymore. 
Therefore, we initiated the conservation education program that aimed to translate the behavior and ecology research findings in a simple ways and able to touch people to care about Japan Gibbon and the rainforest. So today we have regular conservation classes in two primary schools nearby our site that plays a vital role in developed sense of belonging and build pride among the young generation. And we also con we also try to connect the young people in the urban area because actually our site is not so far from the urban area. It still um, it still can be reachable. And the most important thing is um, to bring the local community member as the leader for this program. So this is one of our field assistants that working as the leader for this conservation education program and also involving the next generation of the conservationists to take a lead and we can pass on the torch. So like, for example, these local kids never have a chance to visit the forest in their backyard simply because they don't have any reason to visit it. So we came with a field trip idea and we bring them to explore. And this experience apparently is unforgettable for them. And they can be more relate with the lesson that we teach in the class and they can build the emotional connection with the place and they get curious more because as you know, it's our responsibility to share the legacy and we want the next generation to recognize the treasure that exists nowhere else in this planet. And I want them to be feeling proud and to make sure that at the end, this next generation can hear the song of the Japan Gibbon roaming not in the cage, not only in the zoo, but directly in the forest in the Japan Gibbon's home. So thank you. That's all about um, my presentation. I hope that's good. that can give some insight about what am I doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ayu. And I think um, one thing that, that just went through my mind is that when you showed these kids that um, that field site is actually not that far from, from Jakarta or Bogor. So um, it's, 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 it's accessible and so, so important to work um, with the next generation um, to, to protect the future. So um, thanks for, for, for this, Ayu. We will now move on to, um, to our our next speaker, so we will stay in the field of, of, of conservation um, and the environment, but we'll just move to the, to the neighboring country, to the Philippines, um, and to someone um, who, who is more focusing on the, on, on, on the storytelling side, I would say. So um, Gep Mejia is an international award-winning photographer, conservationist, mountaineer, and emerging storyteller. He has traveled and covered stories on nature from receding glaciers to wetlands and obviously tropical landscapes in his home, um, the Philippines. He is an avid adventurer and mountaineer having scaled mountains across different continents from Northern Africa all the way to the Himalayas and South America. He works as part of the National Youth Council of the WWF in the Philippines. He is a Nikon ambassador and has presented stories as a TEDx speaker. Um, Gap is currently pursuing a civil engineering degree at the University of the Philippines, and he aspires to become an environmental engineer, integrating his career in the arts and science. So um, with that, over to you, Gap. Uh, thanks so much, Yannick, and thank you so much again for the organizers of the Science Agora. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I'll share my screen now. Could you guys see it? Yes, I can. Yeah. So my work is really more on the storytelling side of conservation, as well as integrating science stories in the field work. And before I actually got to travel to these places around the world, around the Philippines, one moment that I actually got was the National Geographic Explorer Early Career Grant that really helped me develop my project and this conservation driven storytelling project in a place in the Philippines called the Agusan Marshlands. So it is the largest inland wetland in the Philippines and one of the largest and actually one of the largest peat swamp forests in Asia found in Southeast Asia. And it's right in the heart of the southernmost province here in their country. It's highly um, conflicted area with a lot of insurgents uh, and a lot of um, environmental defenders being killed. But it's one of the most biodiverse places in a Ramsar Convention. Um, international list of importance of wetlands, as well as an ASEAN natural heritage park. And throughout my journey, it, my, my goal as a photographer, as a storyteller, is really to document and share this forgotten wetland jewel of Asia, especially with the 
different effects and impacts of a changing climate, of the climate crisis, as well as how development and socioeconomic development have affected this pristine and last remaining wilderness in our country. And what's amazing about the Agusan marshlands is really about how it interconnects both the history of the Philippines, the cultures, as well as as well as about the biodiversity, about the importance of our natural world. And throughout my project, I was living with the tribe called the Manobo, an indigenous community that's found living in the flood, ba flood basin in the middle of the lake here in the Agusan marshland. So they live here 24 seven on floating houses where they tie the rafts underneath these bankal trees, locally named bankal trees or these endemic trees found only in this place. So it, the, the, the houses adapt to the flow of water from the rise and fall, especially during the dry season, especially when typhoons. And throughout centuries, they have survived and lived and coexisted in this place. But my goal as a photographer is really to show the issues that are currently happening in this place, in this beautiful and ecologically important place here in the Philippines and even across different places in Southeast Asia as a biodiversity hotspot, as a migratory nesting ground for migratory birds. And the effects of climate change have really impacted the community where the water levels of the lake, the water levels have receded. And it's been going down every single year where now there's another issue that has come was the peatland fires. And what we did was we actually went around this place to cover the fire, the smoke, and the, the amount of land that is being burnt by the prolonged droughts that's caused by the prolonged droughts. So we were able to measure using the drones the, the number of hectares that were being burnt every year. So last year, we were there in 2019. There's plus 140 football fields were wiped out of this place, this peatland protected area in the Talapogon area of the Agusan marshlands. And we also followed and researched on the importance of, of how humans have affected this place where palm oil plantations are increasing, increasing throughout, where they drain the wetlands, they drain the peatlands, even if it's protected by law. And they're building all these roads where it's easily accessible now, and that's interfering with the community and the biodiversity. So this photo was actually captured near a migratory bird uh, egrets where great egrets were roosting and there's about 10,000 flocks there. And when the fires would come up, it would really mix and you would see the birds flying around. And not just that, we also even studied and documented how the droughts have caused water hyacinth blooms and how people living in the marsh who have survived there for years, for hundreds of years, are now experiencing hardships where they can't even canoe. The young children are having a hard time to paddle and use their traditional canoes to go around the marsh to get water, to get food, or to catch fish. Because it's harder to catch fish now since you have all these water hyacinths enshrouding the whole water lake where they, fit, they fish. When, what's sad is that there's really this the youth, the indigenous youth or the community of how their cultures are changing because of something that they really didn't have any much contribution to of how they're being affected so much, leaving their way of life, leaving their traditional canoes and having to move inland because the waters are receding and the typhoons and droughts are getting stronger and stronger every year. And it's harder for them to adapt to this changing climate as well, especially the voiceless, the birds, the biodiversity that have been impacted by the, the cl changing climate and the economic changes that have pushed this society and this environment at the brink. And this is what I really do as a storyteller is really integrating the power of arts, of visual storytelling to be able to show what conservation efforts, what are the real issues that are, that are happening on the field and what research must be done and to amplify the works of scientists, of conservationists, from biology, from culture and history, to be able to really show what the world, what these people are experiencing and how it can actually be used to the government, to lobbying policies, 
and how we can amplify really the work of the future. So actually last month, I was documenting also on the, a COVID grant of the effects of the pandemic to our wildlife in the Philippines, how the pandemic have affected the wildlife rangers, the people who are working in ground in the community in a place called Mount Tiklit Bako, where the, the largest uh, where the rarest wild cattle can be found. So it's only about 500 left. The last counting was in 2019, where 480 individual tamarau, dwarf buffaloes were found. And sadly, because of the pandemic, because of all these experiences that have happened, where the rangers can patrol, the rangers can go around to do their work because of the strict lockdowns. One of the last captive tamarau, the last captive red tamarau, which is the dwarf buffalo, are, has died. And it's a, such a sad experience, but in this horrific experience, there was actually some hope in it, in being able to show how science could actually bring life to this and critically endangered wild cattle, this, this critically endangered species, how they were able to preserve the, the remains and preserve the reproductive system of the Tamarau. This is Kali. Uh, he was 21 years old when he died. And they were able to actually show this, uh, the first ever full skeletal system of the Tamarau, this critically endangered species, because it's hard to get them as a full species, uh, as a full skeletal system in the wild. And how, again, they were able to actually get the reproductive system in the hopes of pushing for future captive breeding program to repopulate the Tamarau in the wild. So we documented really the effects of not just the, the history, but as well as the future of the conservation efforts that are happening around in this park and what it could mean for the people, for the scientists, for the veterinarians working with the Tamarau. So this is actually a baby Tamarau that we had captured in the camera traps, using camera traps in the wild. And it's really an amazing species and what, how much hope that we can show through the visual photos and narratives that we can create through our different stories. And this is what I'm telling really about how visual storytelling, especially with the help of National Geographic has really amplified the work that we're creating into broadening the impact of these stories of how we can lobby to policymakers, lobby to conservationists, and how we can actually give the indigenous communities a voice in this bigger picture of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss that's happening not just in the Philippines but around the world and really without stories we really wouldn't be able to be aware of these issues without going in the field researching living with these communities living with the creatures capturing and document their, their behaviors we would not be able to really understand the impacts and really care for them if we don't know what's happening. So we were able to bring these stories to the media, being able to bring these to global platforms and actually creating fundraising campaigns, being able to create more initiatives, engaging the youth, engaging more local communities to actually really bring their story to the picture of this changing world. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank, th thank you, Gap. And um, as someone working for, uh, for National Geographic, I, I uh, you know, can, can fully support your, your last call for, for uh, or your last statement about the importance and power of storytelling. And I think it links, you know, links to essentially what, what also Yuki and, 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 um, and Ayu, Ayu said, it's, it's so important to get people on board, it's so important to get people to care. And um, in storytelling and, and photography are, are one way um, of, of doing that in a way that reaches, you know, not only in the minds, but also the hearts of, of people and that's that, that transports emotion that, that allows people to care. So Gap, thank you very much. Um, all the speakers, again, thank you so much. All the um, participants that, are, that have um, added their, their questions um, to Slido, um, you know, those on, on, on YouTube as well as those on Zoom. Um, thank you so much. Um, so let's get um, right into this. So we will do the, the questions for the individuals first and then open up to the group. So 
Um, there were a couple of questions um, for, for, for Yuki. And um, I, I just wanted to, to before we get into um, the, the questions from the audience, one, one question that was on my mind, Yuki, is how did you get into Egyptology? Why, why is that the field of study that, that you choose? Why did you end up um, in Egypt? What was the, the driving factor for, for this? Yeah, I don't actually remember whether it is National Geographic or Discovery you as any other you know the French or you know the Japanese documentary. But you know when I was in high school, kids, yeah, uh, I watched in a TV documentary about you know the Great Pyramids, and the two French architects, uh, they are they were in front of the Great Pyramid, and then mentioned that there must be kind of you know the hidden place, hidden space inside the Great Pyramid. So the story was really you know, fascinated. I was really fascinated by their story. And then uh, this just gapped my heart and then decided uh, you know, the, to see. Uh, after that, you know, I actually started to learn hieroglyphics, ancient Egyptian language, even when I was like you know, high school kids. But uh, I really want to go physically to see you know, the monument. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually you know, the starting point of my uh, academic career yeah so you you had the the drive to be an explorer from from um from from very early on <laughs> yes, <thank you. laughs> and, and look i guess if it, if it was Nat national geographic then you have come sort of um full circle now so that's um Finally, that's yeah. <laughs> um another question that i that i have and and you know you you've briefly held up that um you know the the um, relatively basic um, VR um, equipment. Um, so so one thought that I have, I mean, with with these fantastic, you know, hyper real um, 3D models of, of of these pyramids and other um, other cultural heritage sites that exist, what do you actually think that means in the long run that people? What does it mean for protection? What does it mean for conservation that people now in theory can access, you know, through the YouTube link that you've shared and through other tools, access these sites, you know, in their office or, or in their home? What, what do you think are, are the impacts of that? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you know, the commonly, uh, what's commonly sought uh, for archaeology is to find things, but it's a more important, a more importantly to document uh, everything. This is, you know, the one of the most, you know, primary tasks for archaeology. Yeah, because yeah, this can, you know, just generate, uh, you know, uh, for future generation uh, can understand about, you know, the human, uh, you know, the history of the human beings. Yeah. So because you know everything actually, it's because of the ancient monument, it, it's it's will you know eventually gone. So we have to capture everything at moments. So then this capture, you know, physically or digitally, we have to pass to the you know the future generation. Yeah, this is what we believe for you know in the field of archaeology. Yeah, yeah. Well, ab ab absolutely, and uh, I think that's um, that that makes makes a makes a lot of sense. Um, I, there were some some questions from 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 the audience. Um, someone was interested. How do you actually climb? <laughs> yeah, because you know it is an um, ancient monument. We have to climb without the piton and the safety rope. Yeah, we cannot actually you know doing the piton like in the mountain. It is forbidden. So and then slope of the Great Pyramid is like fifty one degree and fifty minutes. It is not so steep, but uh, when you actually see the slope from the top to down it is almost vertical <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah and uh, <laughs> you know the funny thing was I was really you know the worried about you know the you know the cameraman uh, who are with us uh, might fall from the bow uh, because you know uh, he filmed like, like, like that so <laughs> yeah and then he also confessed that you know uh, he's there you know uh, you know terrified of the height and then <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, it's, yeah. it's not a good place to work if you're terrified of heights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And also, we have to actually you know, sign, you know, the Egyptian authority are not responsible for you know what we are doing. But but simply, I can just climb without pitting and the safety rope. Yeah. Okay. Um. And and someone what someone else is asking. Um. Are there any difficulties or obstacles if you 
want to go and become an Egyptologist and study about pyramids? So what are, what are the, the difficulties of getting into that field? Uh, actually, there's not so, you know, uh, special uh, particular difficulties. For academic purpose, it is actually open. You know, everybody can apply for uh, pyramid study. However, it is, of course, you know, up to the permanent committee, Egyptian permanent committee to decide whether or not, you know, the concession will come down. So, but uh, it is actually open whether Egyptian or foreigner can apply yeah, to study yeah, pyramid, but you have to get a PhD uh, for university and then uh, you have to have the experience and about, you know, uh, archaeological uh, field of archaeology, but it, it's actually open, yeah. But I mean, you have spent 16 years in, in Egypt, so do most other international scientists also spend that much time or is 16 years a long time? For being in Egypt? No, uh, it's, uh, you know, for us, uh, uh, you know, the archaeologists from uh, like America, you know, Germany, French, and uh, they've been working for more than, you know, of course, uh, yeah, more than 16 years, of course, e even a person, uh, an archaeologist, yeah. Okay. But maybe, you know, uh, I'm, my career is a bit strange because I actually moved to Egypt after I graduated from high school. But because normally people, you know, got to Egypt after graduated from university and then tried to be, uh, you know, involved in uh, archaeological mission after, you know, after that. But uh, I just jumped into, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, this is a bit strange. You were, <laughs> You were um, embedded from, from, from the beginning. And um, the, the last question, and you touched upon this um, a little bit uh, in the presentation when you mentioned, you know, there was this, this spectacular photo that you were on top of the pyramid, uh, but you said that actually using your, um, your camera, you were, um, you were not able to, um, to, to get the data for the 3D model. So you needed to use one of the spy planes to... Um, <laughs> Um, to do that. So um, what is the, um, someone was asking basically, how do you make these three data and, and what are the process and what kind of pictures um, do you need in order to create these, um, these, these super real models? Yeah, so we started to use, you know, the laser scanner, uh, which emit to, you know, the laser uh, to the object and to get in the point. Uh, then we collect we you know the collected in this point. This point contain you know the x y z z you know the coordinate, but uh, we have another you know the technique called in structure from motion technique. Uh, we get uh, like an uh, you know the image uh, data, and then with structure motion technique, you can actually uh, reconstruct uh, you know the position where actually uh, you know the picture taken. From this email, from this information, we can finally uh, produce 3D data from 2D image data sets. So uh, this is particularly, you know, the uh, benefit, I mean, it's, it's good for to reconstruct of the pyramid because pyramid is like, you know, 100, you know, 32 meter, you can actually not get uh, you know the data uh, on the ground setting laser scanner you have you really have to use you know the drone to get the image from the top to down yeah and do you need um special i mean i can imagine that for, for a pyramid that there's a lot of data points do you can you use regular computers or do you need to use some kind of supercomputers for these models uh first yeah if your data set it's like you know let's say uh, a few hundreds yeah you don't need any special computer uh special you know the powerful machine but uh, since our you know the, the pyramid at giza yeah we gather 30,000 and then yeah we really uh, spend a lot of money and <laughs> to be honest and uh, it spend a lot of time to to uh, produce uh, 3d data it's actually took almost you know, two years yeah uh, to yeah to obtain perfect you know the survey data yeah if you want to get uh, like you know just a computer graphic image of the Giza pyramid it doesn't take time maybe just you know uh, a few days to create in a 3d data of the beautiful 3d image but uh, for yeah. purpose so we have to integrate you know the uh, GNSS I mean uh, survey data uh, with computer graphic image so this takes really time and then we also we try to 
uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, produce, you know, very detailed uh, image of the pyramid. So it's really took time, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I can imagine. Um, well, thank you, um, Yuki. Let's let's um, let's turn to the questions um, that we had for for um, for for Ayu. Um, and and you know you've emphasized both um, in in your presentation and and also um, in in the introduction. I've I've, I've mentioned that as well that sort of making the local communities and 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 having a local team um and making them stewards of the land is is, is very important we all know that um, making career in conservation is 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 very hard it's not necessarily something that brings a lot of wealth um to your family so um can you talk a little bit about how you engage um these people and and what works to inspire them to to make this a career to make this um, their responsibility? Um, thank you, Anik. So at the first, yeah, that's one thing that uh, came in my mind when we started this, uh, this project. I'm not, I'm not started from the first of the, like the foundation or the establishment of the camp itself, but after I graduated and then I work in this project and then I realized we need some more and more collaboration with the local community because we are living in their surrounding and it's really important to share what we, we are known or what we gather from the information from the field. And we try to, well, one of the, um, well, the, the, the community itself is kind of curious is what actually we are doing in the field and how we can be like the involved in this project as well, because they also need to earn some money and also to, to, to give like, we want to give some benefit uh, in the economical sector as well. So we think that this opportunity to become the field assistant will be really important for them as well. So we try to train them and um, one time that when they go into the forest and then they find the gibbon so everybody will love the gibbons when once you see the gibbon and see them moving you feel that kind of like the sense of connection with them and it's very graceful and it's privileged to see them swinging freely in the forest and at the time i think it can touch the heart and um, the kind of thing that give hands off experience with the local community members, give them some insight or give them some inspiration. So this forest is very important. This gibbon is very, 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 very necessary as well to regenerate the forest. And we keep doing that until now because we want to involve more and more the local community members. Yeah, well, it's 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 their home, it's their place, um, their place where where um where they grew up. And it's it's uh, it's it's really great to see um how how you're you're integrating them um one of the um audience members was um was was asking if you could talk a little bit more about um about the javan gibbons because oh. i think that audience member says the first time they've seen or or, or heard about the javan gibbons so they are you know how how are they related to um to other monkeys and and and, and so on so can you talk a little bit about that please Yes, yeah, sure. So yeah, that's a uh, that's very important question. And then yeah, most of the people don't know about the gibbons. Gibbons are not as sexy as the great apes like orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzee, or bonobo. And many people know them or mistaken them as the monkeys, but instead they are the small apes because they have no tails. And then they're actually more closely with the um, great apes like the gorilla or the orangutan. And in the world itself, especially in the Asia, there are 20 species of the gibbons, and all of them are located from the Indonesia to the China. And then from these 20 species, all of them are endangered. And nine species of them are located in Indonesia, four of them in Sumatra, and four of them in Kalimantan, in another uh, big island in Indonesia, but only one of them is living or still survive in the Java Island. Many people don't know that the Java is still like there's still remaining forests in the Java because, because there's many population, many people are living in this island. So people don't know that the, some forests are still access and we are working on it. We built the campaign to make people more aware that the forest is still access and we need to protect it. Absolutely. And um, I have good news for you. Um, one other person fell in love with the sound of the, of oh. the <laughs> 
um, but that that person was was um, was asking if um, if you're afraid when you're observing the gibbons in the forest. Well, um, well, actually, um, I'm falling in love with the gibbons by accident. So my first love is the orangutan. So just like as the many primatologists, all of the people love orangutan, and so do I. And then uh, during my bachelor uh, degree, I tried to find the funding to, to do the research about the orangutan, but I couldn't find anything. And then my advisor said, there's the opportunity to start the research about the Japan gibbon. And I didn't know at all about the Japan gibbon itself at the time. And then, yeah, well, that's the only option that I had for graduated. So yeah, I just follow it. And then once I hear this song, I knew that the, I have to learn more about these species. And I think in the forest itself, I feel like there's kind of like the atmosphere that uh, makes me feel calm and uh, bring me to be present and just enjoying the things. So that's one thing that uh, I, I'm, I'm not afraid about. And I always bring GPS. <laughs> <laughs> So not like the other members, like the, our field assistant, they can go home just just by intuition. But for me, I still need GPS to come back home. So yeah, yeah. I'm not really afraid with the uh, with the forest, though, but I'm more afraid with the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think good that you're bringing um, the the GPS. That's uh, that, that you can always um, come back and and for me, I mean, listening to them almost is a kind of a Zen moment. I think oh. it's, it's, um, it sounds. Um, very very peaceful um well thanks thanks are you and um we had a couple of questions um for, for for gap um as well to um i guess to 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 start off is um someone said that your your pictures um are 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 so so nice and, and amazing but what's the secret behind making amazing and powerful images it's really a lot of research in creating these images. You need to know where you're going before you even get there. So you have to really research like where the birds are, where the people are and gain their trust, especially in finding these emotion, especially like for the fires, we had to chase them uh, using a car, finding what location, because it's a really, really huge uh, park, a uh, yeah. really, really huge wetland. And sometimes you even have to take the boat. So I think, there's a, in these pictures that we create, there's really that you can't see that most of the time, all the research, all the, the hard work that you do before you even take that photo is hidden. Yeah, that's, that's probably the part that, uh, yeah, that, that not a lot of, um, not a lot of people see, but um, I guess once you, um, you've done the research, once you've, you've done the photography, once you, you're telling the stories, how do you actually measure the impact of your stories and, and, and publications into sort of direct or indirect science or, or conservation output? So how do you track the things and, and how, when do you know that, that all this work was worth it? When, when do you know that you've actually changed something? So usually when we start to create a story, we, we think of really the objectives of this story. Are you here to protect the part? Are you here to reach out to youth? Are you here to reach out to the governor or to the mayor, the government officials managing the park? So that's really how we measure the impact. So that story actually about the fires, it was the first time that the, the governor of that place knew about it and he didn't know that it was happening in his backyard. And that kind of made of a significant impact because he demanded all the rangers and he gave stipends and all these support systems just so that they can put out the fire they even had like the the, la the local fire station to be like the first one mandated to put out and extinguish peatland fires so that's really an amazing thing and really it's about the the impact is really based on what objectives we think of first okay yeah that that makes that that makes a lot of sense to be um to be, to, i guess to be very strategic into um where where you want to go and 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 um what what these efforts um are there for so um and and someone asked um this is 
I guess, related to, to storytelling, but it's really, what can the general public do to protect species, natural diversity in their daily lives? Do you have some tips for, for, for the audience um, to make a positive impact you know, in their daily life when they might not have the opportunity to go into these fantastic landscapes or take amazing photography? Well, I think the first step is really to know about these issues that are happening in your homeland. In your, it might not be even in the Philippines. It could be in Indonesia. It could be in Japan. It could be in Egypt. I don't know. And being aware of these issues, then you can actually research on things and take the initiative, your own initiative, to find your own solution. Because even there's a lot of like environmental problems we're facing, not just wetlands or habitat loss or like biodiversity loss. We have plastic pollution. We have climate change. And by knowing these problems, you can do the initiative to really research and find the solutions that you could do in your daily life. May it be like conserving water or volunteering in organizations, environmental organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Gab. I mean, Ayu or, or Yuki, do, do you have any anything to, to add to this? We can open it up now to the, to the whole panel. Um, I'm, I agree with Gab because at the first you have to be curious about what is it going about um, like the issues around your site or around your home and take action from there and support the local NGO as well. Be involved mm -hmm. as the volunteer. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think if I, if I may add, I think one, one important part, obviously, you know, if you talk about local NGOs and we're talking about COVID and we're talking about um, difficult times for everyone, if you care about an issue and if you have um, some income to spare, do donate to organizations that work on issues that you care about. Because I think um, a lot of organizations are struggling, are impacted um, from, from COVID. And um, these organizations need to need to um, need to survive. Um, but you know, we we also want to talk with all of you a little bit about the um, the impact of COVID nineteen and and what a strange year twenty twenty um, has been with um, you know with a lot of um, tragedies that are impacting human health, human life, human livelihoods. Um, but um, yeah, it would be great if if all of you could share a little bit about how COVID has impacted both your personal and, and your professional life this year and, um, and what has changed in this year. So, uh, like, you know, I'm a archaeologist and of course, you know, my team cannot go to, you know, archaeological survey in Egypt, uh, but uh, it was actually, you know, got good opportunity for our team to deal with you know, a huge amount of, you know, the 3D data we have uh, you know, acquired so far. Um, yeah, and then, you know, uh, of course, you know, the various restrictions associated with COVID-19 were actually uh, its problem, but also it's a good opportunity for us to explore the digital world in more depth. And then it is actually, you know, to give birth to like in the pyramid of VR, uh, which I just showed you. So, uh, yeah, and then and also, you know, that allowed me to offer, you know, the online lecture, not to the, you know, the local Japanese, but uh, to people all over the world. Yeah, actually, you know, the, my team is international, and we are like, you know, based in different parts of the world. So uh, we are actually used to working online. So uh, so there's uh, actually not so inconvenience. Yeah, this time either. So. Yeah, like. I can I can I can see that happening, and I think that's that's for for um for for many other scientists that now had the chance to 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 write publications, to go through their data set, um and and to 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 make up time. And I think in in every challenge there there is an opportunity, and and as much as there's tra 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 tragedy this year, I think there there are um new opportunities, new way of doing things that that um that come up. Gap and and Ayu, do you have any anything to um to to share on, on this aspect um yeah COVID has impact our activities in like early april and um, due to the close of the national park we have to stop our field activity as well so there's no field activity there's no monitoring for like four months and we lost that kind of the long-term data set at a time but one thing that we should um, remember or aware of like 
the safety and the healthy of the local community is the most important thing. So then we stop it. And fortunately, we can go back again to the field, start from August, and we restart it again, all of the activity with a new procedure. So just like, as you know, the, uh, the primate species, yeah, the non-human primate species also have like the risk, the high risk infection of the COVID-19, uh, also for the gibbon as well. So we developed the new field protocol and that required the, uh, the, 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 the core team to, to wearing masks and also use the hand sanitizer and more, more safety in the health or in the sanitary uh, stuff. And also we start to um, build the awareness for the local community in our sites and yeah, that's one thing that uh, we learned from this COVID. And Gap, anything that that um, that has changed or that you've learned um, from 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 COVID? Yeah, actually, the COVID really impacted a lot of the storytelling projects and productions that are happening. Was supposed to happen this year, and because of all the lockdowns, the strict lockdowns, and especially the risk that you can give to the communities or to the subjects that you're going to be documenting or you're going to be working with. So that was a precautionary thing that we had to really consider. And like looking forward though, COVID really was a really game changer for also storytellers to be able to show the impacts. It was an opportunity to, for us to show what's wrong with the world or what's, what's wrong that's happening in the world and how we can actually learn from it and develop stories that can help us prevent the next pandemic from happening. Yeah, that's that's um, that's a very very good point, and um, that's a very good close um, to this to this to this panel um, to this panel as well. So, um, before I I say goodbye, I'd like to um, give the opportunity once more to to thank um, Science Agora, to thank all the participants. Um, for joining us, but most importantly, I want to thank JST, the Japan Science and Technology Agency. And um, we now have the pleasure to have um, Atsushi Arakawa, who, who is the director of the Department of Promotion um, of, of Science in Society of JST, um, to give some, some closing remarks um, from, um, from his end. So Arakawa-san, the, um, the virtual floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Yannick san. So good afternoon, or should I say good evening, <laughs> everyone. So I'm Atsushi Arakawa uh, from JST. So allow me to say a few words on behalf of the organizer of Science Agora 2020. So thank you very much for very, very impressive uh, presentations. I've been deeply impressed by the passionate effort of explorers uh, to observe and conserve nature, culture, and biodiversity, as well as, as storytelling for public engagement. I would also like to express my respect for the National Geographic Society for its very, very long time continuing support uh, for these important efforts. The individual efforts are very important, of course, but I believe that such efforts can be more successful when they are implemented by a variety of supporters and interested parties in a creative manner, I believe. Um, this session was held as a part of Science Agora, one of Japan's largest open forums for connecting science and society. As you know, the word Agora means square or open space in green. We at JST hold the Science Agora with the aim of bringing science and society together so that citizens can learn about science and make it possible to work together across the sectors to solve the global challenges such as the, uh, sustainable development goals. I, strong, I strongly hope that many people will learn about this wonderful work here in Science Agora and nurture new networks and collaborations for further development of each activity. Last year, a conference called the World Science Forum was held in Budapest, Hungary, uh, where experts in science and technology from around the world gathered. At the end of the conference, a declaration was adopted. The first pillar of the declaration was the importance of science for global well-being. 
I believe the activity of each explorer and the National Geographic Society are consistent with this concept. And we at JST as well, will continue to promote a variety of activities with the conviction that science and technology should contribute to the well-being of the world. Uh, to conclude uh, my talk, so uh, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to everyone joining this session and uh, wonderful explorers and Yannick San for wonderful uh, facilitation of this session and our staff for their dedicated contribution. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Arakawa-san. Um, thank you for, for, for these um, remarks. This is um, much appreciated and I cannot um, agree more with you that I think we, we, there's, there's a lot that we share and I think science education um, and, and um, general public understanding science is so, so important um, and is something that, that we're working on and I hope that is something that we can um, work on together more in the future. So. Um, and with, with that, I'd like to, to thank all the participants. I'd like to thank JST um, staff again. Um, and this was um, a really interesting session. I wish we had half an hour more to keep the conversation going because there are some, some questions uh, from in the Slido that I did not yet have the time to ask. And um, it was very, very interesting, but I think this shows the um, the fascinating world of science, that there is so much to discuss and so much to find out. And um, so thank you all and um, see you next time. Do visit um, the, 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 the websites of, of, of all the involved um, institutions of National Geographic, of JST, of Science Agora for, for other events and of the explorers and um, take care everyone and stay well and stay healthy. Bye bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Yannick. Thank you. Okay, Yannick. Thank you for everyone. Bye. Bye bye.